Hello, and a, a warm good evening to you all. Uh, I'm Stephen Ginsborg. Uh, I'm the only man this evening on the webinar. Last time in this series in July, it was three men and one woman. One woman. So uh, we're keeping the gender balance. And looking at the 1,500 participants who've registered to join us for tonight, and no surprises, the larger part of the audience are women. So that's always of note when we're talking about carers. So welcome for joining us to tonight's webinar, supporting carers of older people, as well as the viewers who will be watching the recording later. If you hear thunder, it's because up here, they we're in a major thunderstorm. I'd like to start by acknowledging and respecting all ancestral lands of Australia's first peoples who represent the oldest surviving living culture on the planet. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. We have an opportunity to co-create a nation that is proud of and embraces Australia's first peoples, history, culture and rights for present and future generations. I'd also like to acknowledge the elders of all the other cultures who live on these lands and respect their knowledge and their wisdom. I'm calling in from Gamma Regal country and if you feel like practicing with the chat facility, you might want to let others know which land and country you are calling in from. So make yourselves comfortable with suitable refreshments and let's get started on what I feel will be a rewarding evening with our panellists, Marika, Lynette and Alison, and of course our imaginary family, Rosa, Phil and their community of care. Now, this webinar is the result of a unique partnership between the 31 Australian Primary Health Networks and the Mental Health Professionals Network. MHPN. In a first in their history, the 31 PHNs have formed a consortium and engaged MHPN to plan, produce and broadcast three webinar, webinars in the next 12 months, focusing on older Australians and mental health. So now that was written at the beginning of the series. So we this is the second of these webinars. The first was in July and was called Primary Care, Older Persons and Mental Health. And you can find a recording of that on the MHPN site. And then next year, the last of the three will be exploring aging from a First Nations and multicultural perspective. Tonight's panel, I think you've all got uh, bios of them and uh, they're all, all wonderful people. That's sounding like Trump. Um, no one's <laughs> going to get the sack though. And um, there's the webinar, webinar platform. Um, just, I'll leave that on for a moment. The resources, including the case study, with the blue button with the biographies and the supporting resources so um, you won't need the feedback survey until the end but do use the chat room uh, we've already gathered questions that you've sent in before and uh, we've uh, incorporated those into general questions that we'll come to in the Q&A section so these are the learning outcomes. I won't read them to you. But I hope we will meet those learning outcomes. No surprises there. And this is where we go first to Marika Contelis, a social worker by training, but importantly also a manager of a social service organization. And I think we'll see that word respect coming up again and again. So thank you, Marika. 
Thanks so much, Stephen, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. I realise that um, when I was asked to do this, that I'm actually officially an old social worker. So there you have it. Um, I uh, have spent some time with uh, our wonderful panel and really unpacked this situation from what uh, we call a social work perspective. And as you know, all social workers work from a sort of theory, practice theory. And we, we often um, talk about uh, respect for the person. We look through the lens of social justice. We're always really quite um, focused on professional integrity, not unlike other disciplines, of course. Um, but when we, we look at roses, not roses, uh, but Rosa and Phil's situation, we really need to think about what respect looks like. And the first thing is we really need to acknowledge the long-term commitment and love this couple has. Um, we need to recognise Rosa's caring role and her exceptional care of Phil, certainly through my experience, um, even most recently at CCNB. When you stop and you look a carer in the eyes and you say, you're doing such a wonderful job caring for your husband. Um, often that just melts a whole load of resistance away. Uh, recognising and respecting both Rose's and Phil's intellect and the, um, their amazing uh, work contribution and respecting that despite her need uh, to get a knee done, uh, she's actually not ready and she's not confident. Um, so respect is really important and I use this very complicated model. Uh, mm -hmm. You give respect, you ultimately get respect. Um, it's not rocket science. Um, the other thing that uh, I would do and what a social worker would do is really look at what's fair. Um, and access to information, advice and guidance is absolutely pivotal for Rosa at this time. Don't assume um, but really seek to understand her reluctance. We often are really quick to say, yeah, look, most carers are reluctant. She doesn't want to leave Phil, um, et cetera. We need to understand her options, and she certainly does, and the potential consequences so she can make informed choices. And you'll all know and understand the whole concept of dignity of risk. And that's what we need to afford Rosa in this situation. Um, you know, this whole thing about professional integrity is um, often, um, as professionals, we really need to have this considered and sort of self-reflective uh, reflections around what our intervention looks like. We have to be transparent, etc. cetera. Um, my uh, uh, way of working uh, with people, and I certainly have learned this over probably the last decade, uh, not only through my professional experience, but my lived experience as a carer, it takes a village. Um, and there will be better outcomes for Rosa Phil and the extended family, Francesca and her kid and her husband, are more lo likely if we take this sort of broader view, multidisciplinary approach, which absolutely includes building a community of support around Rosa so she can continue to care for Phil. I'm hoping to unpack that a little bit this afternoon, evening, um, as we work through, um, you know, mapping where are Rose's support. Um, and this is about enhancing her informal and trusted support system. Um, I'm sure Stephen tonight will talk about, and I know I will, this whole notion of a compassionate community around uh, people at their point of need. We want to support her to understand that her health and her well-being will actually help to determine feels um, and taking a little bit of control around that's really important. Um, you know, we often talk about assessment and I've got one more minute, I think. Um, we often talk about assessment. I take a very um, uh, laissez-faire approach to assessing someone's needs, someone's like Rose's needs. She's already probably been through assessments uh, if she's accessing any services or has heard about them. I often ask people, what do you miss doing or who do you miss seeing? Um, tell me about who you can rely on, who do you trust? What worries you the most? What gives you joy? Um, and what help do you think Phil and you need to stay health, happy and healthy at home? Um, and those questions 
often help unpack and present a whole range of potential interventions. Um, at the end of the day, the glue um, with all practitioners is, is this thing about trust. And trust is about building that relationship, being reliable, um, actually being really present and showing up when you're with Rosa and Phil, um, that there are no, there is no one more important at that point in time. Um, and that's how I've been able to build trust as I've worked with people and I'm sure you've got other techniques yourself. Um, this whole thing is called a system theory where we look at Rosa's behaviour and problems from her perspective in this context of some complexity, which is her caring role and her relationship with her daughter, etc. Ultimately, the first step um, is to make a judgment about what approach will enable trust. Um, and for me, that always is, the rest is easier. I think, I, I, did, I do, did I do well, Stephen? Was that you less did, than you five did minutes? Brilliant. You did brilliantly. And, and it's interesting, uh, many years ago, a, a famous psychiatrist gave a lecture I went to, and uh, she was uh, saying that psychiatrists only prescribe these days not true, but she was making a point. So she said, now if you want if you want to have someone talk to you about your problems, see a social worker, see an occupational therapist, see a psychologist. She must have had a premonition of this of this evening. And she said, trust them all, for the meek will inherit the earth. And indeed I think for the, for what we're looking at tonight, uh, you three hold the key to the support of the carers and we GPs often, even though the patient, client, customer, citizen is attached to what we say, uh, I always advise them to listen to the real experts who visit people in their homes and really get to know them. So thank you, Marika. I think you, you set that scene very well. Um, Next, Lynette um, yeah. and OT certainly have inherited the earth because uh, you're the gatekeepers for ACAT. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Lynette, you're, you're going to bring your wealth of your the wealth of experience uh, to uh, give us a little idea of what you can do for Rosa and Phil's care. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So, I'm often asked what do OTs do? So I thought I'd just stick this one in first. <laughs> so um, occupational therapy is a client-centered health profession, so we're all client-centered and I loved what Marika talked about the questions that she asked as part of her assessment. Very, very similar to the sort of approach that we would have as well. And the primary goal of occupational therapy is to help people participate in the activities of everyday life, whatever they may be. And of course, they will vary from person to person. So the importance of building relationship with Rosa is going to be incredibly important, as Marika hinted at. And um, in order for us to determine what those activities of daily life are and what has the most meaning for Rosa. So we tend to operate by working with people and communities to enhance engagement in the occupations that people want to do, what they need to do, or what they are expected to do. So occupational therapy is really about doing stuff, and sometimes that means modifying what it is you do or how you do it, or modifying the environment to better support the occupations that you can do. So that's a bit of a potted version of what an occupational therapist does because we work with all sorts of people. In this instance, we're talking about an older carer, but um, that same definition holds true for a range of different areas where occupational therapists work. So the sort of model I use is called the person environment occupation model. As I said before, occupational performance is what we're interested in, so people being able to do things. 
so my first thought by looking at the case study was to think about, well, what about the person who is Rosa? So we have a few clues in the um, case study we were given. So she's very much centred on successfully caring for Phil and that appears to be her primary role. And we have a few other sort of notes about her, her condition from the um, case study as well. If we think about the environment, we don't know much about the home. We don't know much about the physical aspect of the home at all, other than it's got lots of Phil's papers in it. So for me, I would really want to um, do a home visit in order to sort of gather that sort of information. Her garden is precious to her, but she may well have had to deal with the change a little bit. There's also, sorry, there's lightning and stuff outside. I can hear it. <laughs> um, there's also limited support from her daughter or the amount of support has changed. She seems to have some support from her neighbour, Nelly. But um, as Marika said, that whole community of support needs to be addressed. And now she's been put in a position where she's having to navigate a whole bunch of services. And ACAT was mentioned and the My Age Care website and everything is probably enough to send most older people who are feeling a bit vulnerable to start with into a head spin. So there are some issues with just being a user of health services as well. So that's all part of the environment. And then the occupations that she engages in, as I said earlier, I think her carer role is her key occupation at the moment. And it seems to be to the exclusion of lots of other things like looking after herself, being a self-maintainer. She also had a previous role supporting Phil's career. And she was quite active. There's a whole list of things that she used to do, which are probably not happening as often anymore. And she's now having to focus on caring for Phil, partly because he needs a lot of supervision. So I'd be a bit concerned about that because I've done some research about what um, the burden of caring is for older people if their partner with dementia has any sort of self-care needs. So that's a red flag for me. It makes me wonder if she drives, we don't know that makes me wonder how she gets out of the house to do her shopping, whether she can actually leave Phil or whether there's anyone that can sit with him if she has to go out and do something. So there are quite a few red flags there for me. So as I said earlier, my potential intervention would be to go and meet Rosa and Phil and try to build a relationship with her. And a lot of um, relationships take several home visits to um, develop. So the idea that you can get it all sorted out in one hit is rather unrealistic. So it may require a sort of ongoing sort of um, relationship building exercise. But we'd, I'd want to have a chat to Rosa to work out what sorts of self-care things she's having difficulty with, any tasks at home she's having difficulty with. Like um, the, the case study did mention that she's not presenting herself very well. So that would put a few um, red flags up for me. And um, she's obviously got issues with her knee and even pre any idea of surgery, there'd be a whole heap of things we can do to make transfers easier for her at home. And post-surgery, she would definitely need some assistance with that. And identification of any sort of home hazards. It, I mean, we're only told about the clutter, but there could be any range of falls related hazards in the home. So. That would be an obvious thing to have a look at. There are also 
some really good programs available. One that I know of particularly is the Tailored Activity Program, which is a program for people with dementia and their carers to try and re-engage the person with dementia into activities that they find enjoyable. And that can offer some respite and relief to the carer as well. So there's a reference there if anyone's interested in that. So I think that's it from me. Oh no, how to get hold of an occupational therapist. So I believe there's quite a few GPs on this call. So an occupational therapist is, as, as Stephen mentioned, uh, often involved in ACAT assessments and would make recommendations for both Rose and Phil, but that depends whether or not the GP gets as far as making an ACAT referral with um, Rose's permission. GPs can also get occupational therapists involved through a chronic disease management program for Rosa, especially for falls prevention. So I would expect them to include an OT and a physio. And local community health centres run by the local health districts normally employ occupational therapists as well. So there are a variety of ways you can get hold of someone that might be able to help. Okay, I think that's me now, Stephen. Well, that's some of you, <laughs> only some. <laughs> it's a lot more information you've got there. Uh, and I, I can't think how many times I've said, borrowing from the ever popular TV series called The Midwife, call the OT. Because <laughs> really, uh, there are situations uh, uh, that uh, are absolutely um, perfect for for the for the tasks that that you can do. Um, it's uh, it's a it's a problem, isn't it, when when families uh, haven't been able to get an ACAT assessment, and given the waiting list for yes. packages, that's Home the routine. Packages, yes. Yep, yes. yep. Yep. We'll maybe come to mention a little bit um, about that uh, later. So um, thank you for that. Um, now, last but not least, Alison, to give uh, us some insight into the psychological and emotional care of a carer's needs, particularly uh, Rosa, and how we can try and meet those needs. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it may surprise you all, but I won't necessarily just stick to the topic of emotional and psychological support. Um, so this first slide really is just a representation of what everyone's been describing in terms of the holistic care that we all like to deliver. And the assumptions I think we can all make are that Rosa um, is a really loving wife intent on keeping Phil at home. Um, we can also assume from the story that she believes that she can actually do this on her own. Um, so that's a really interesting one and, and quite common. Um, and also I'm assuming that Rosa is putting herself second and Phil first, which is also incredibly um, common in that cohort. Um, and um, for all of our mothers particularly. Um, so the risks for both Rosa and Phil, in my opinion, are quite high in this scenario. And when I'm talking about risks, I'm particularly talking about um, the risk of carer burnout uh, and also the risk of Phil um, prematurely going into hospital and or going into an aged care facility, which is the exact opposite of what Rosa's trying to achieve. Uh, so, weighing up where to begin um, is this visual slide trying to capture what my brain uh, does. So there's actually multiple reasons why a, a carer will refuse help. Um, often it's lack of knowledge about dementia. They, they actually don't realise that it's impossible uh, for one person to continue to look after someone with dementia on their own. I have never seen a carer succeed and, um, and that's many thousands of examples. <laughs> um, often um, it can be to do with fear, sometimes pride. Uh, other people um, are more deserving is a common one. 
um, particularly from females. Um, and I had one the other day where um, the husband didn't disclose what was going on to ACAT because he didn't um, want to ruin his wife's reputation, um, even though it was actually a symptom of dementia. So the risk assessment, um, as I said, um, is, is uh, also important in terms of um, physical risks for both of them, um, medical risks, emotional risks as well, um, and a lot of the risks uh, are unnecessary. Uh, so this isn't about the conversation about dignity of risk, this is about Um, and I've just put a note in there that stress and burnout can actually really impede an, a person's ability to take information in. Um, so just keeping that, that in mind when we're trying to uh, educate people. Um, so it's important to really appreciate where what Rose's understanding is, her attitude, and also her responsibilities in terms of where Phil's dementia is up to. Um, so. The next slide is just a different way of looking at um, what everyone's been talking about in terms of um, uh, someone moving from carer burnout into um, the carer being able to thrive um, and looking at mitigating risk um, by putting in supports and um, targeting specific um, behaviours and psychological symptoms of dementia um, and educating the carer. Um, uh, various um, principles. Uh, this is another way of looking at that holistic care that we're all um, trying to achieve. Um, so with Rosa in the, in the centre there, uh, this is about uh, appreciating her on every level um, possible and appreciating the informal and formal support, uh, of course, as well as her uh, medical health needs um, and pretty much using anything and everything we can to create that network around Rosa. Um, and this last screen is the most important um, from my perspective and this is how I view um, whenever I'm working with the care of someone with dementia because it's actually impossible um, to do the one person without um, the other. So it's about knowing the carer um, and, and asking, just being curious about them and also knowing the person with dementia and a lot of that information often comes from the carer as well as meeting the person themselves. Home visits are gold, um, so that was an OT that actually taught me back <laughs> that in the early days of ACAT, so thanks to the OTs. Um, and um, also having a really good understanding of dementia, it would again be nigh on impossible to really help this couple without understanding the ins and outs and the nuances of the dementia itself. And just that pyramid there is tends to be the order I do things in, which is that rapport building first um, and then fine tuning. Um, and then once everyone's settled, that's when uh, it tends to be the best time to address that grief and loss. Uh, so that's it from me for now. Thank you. Uh, that, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I would agree um, totally that uh, Home, home visits are gold. Uh, my dad taught me that. He was a GP in a, in a suburb of London. And uh, unfortunately, in Australia, the, the figures show that home visits by GPs have tailed right off except in, in country areas. So we really do have to work as a team relying on, on you uh, in, your, in your disciplines to, to be the eyes and ears. Uh, uh, digital solutions probably won't won't solve it, even though there's interest in in the digital solution. So um, uh, maybe if I go back to Marika, so that uh, we'll do it in order and just do a starter question. Um, uh, Marika, how can how can we involve Francesca in the conversation about care and support, and indeed Nelly, the neighbour? Uh, and as Alison said, it, it takes a village, and I think that's probably what you were referring to when you spoke about compassionate communities, um, especially there's a, a definition going around of compassion, which is empathy and action. 
So yes. uh, compassion is too soft a word sometimes for healthcare professionals. Empathy we all should have, but we like a bit of action. So um, would you like to pick up there, Marika, and then yeah. you, you other two just feel free to join a conversation at this stage. Sure, sure. I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I think again, from we need to see Rosa and Phil in context, and in context of all the strengths that they have uh, to continue to live at home safely um, and you know, happily irrespective of the dementia, irrespective of the bad knee, irrespective of, you know, the garden needing tending or whatever whatever other challenges they are. I think um, in order to involve Francesca again, um, the key is to build trust with 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 Rosa. She is the gatekeeper um, to 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 wellness for both her and and to fill. I would um, certainly want to establish that trust, whatever that looks like, absolutely a home visit is the way to go. Um, conversation, sharing of, of knowledge, uh, sharing of experiences um, that will then allow that front door to open just a little bit. Um, it is absolutely legit to involve uh, daughters. I know in my circumstance I'm a very involved daughter but my dad's the primary carer uh, and for a long time his major issue was he didn't want people to see my mum um, bumbling and not being able to find her words. He didn't want to, her to be embarrassed because of her memory loss or her agitation and as a response to that is he didn't want to include others or seek help and in many ways didn't even want to see some of that external informal network because it was really putting my mum on show that she wasn't well. And in Rose's case, uh, her hesitation is, you know, Phil was a successful man, she supported him, uh, he was clever, he had an amazing career. Um, she might not want everyone to see that his dementia is making him behave differently. So I would want to really work with her over you know, a couple of home visits and then say, look, how about we, we have a chat to Francesca and see what she thinks. Um, I'm not sure what my other colleagues on the panel would also add to that. Go for it, you two. <laughs> well, on behalf of Rosa, I think the first, it's Alison here, I think the first thing she would say is, oh no, Francesca's way too busy. So, because she's, in, in the story it said that earlier in the year, she's pulled back. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm not sure um, that would work immediately, but I agree with everything else. <laughs> Um, it's it's all about that rapport, isn't it? And um, understanding why Rose is saying no and, and thinking that she can do it on her own. Um, I often find that it is just truly a genuine uh, lack of understanding from, from the public about dementia. Everyone says that they know what dementia is, but when it comes to the crunch, I really feel... Um, I, I'm pretty... Um, straightforward with people and I come straight out and let them know that in my in all of my years I have never ever seen a carer manage to do it on their own so I use that trade-off for them and say if your goal is to keep Phil at home um, then um, this the only way to do it um, you know and I work from leveraging that so Absolutely. Yes, very much. Lynette, is your microphone working? No. Something's dropped out there. We'll just carry on while the tech people behind fix things up. But uh, yes, I, I, I absolutely agree and that, uh, and this is what you were saying, it takes a village. Um, uh, dutiful daughters are all very well when they, when they can uh, do the duty as it were, but um, and I love it that there's an organisation called Dutiful Daughters to uh, stand in 
when the dutiful daughters can't and, and, and why, why should they be expected to? In that compassionate communities model, there's a, there's a, a saying goes around, um, uh, what's in the larder? So you, when you get, you know when we go into the larder, we don't think there's anything there, and it's it's just uh, Rosa and Phil, um, and maybe a pet. Um, we try and see maybe if Francesca can't be uh, a person who helps. Does she know anyone who's close enough? I've known situations where someone goes through the, the phone book with the family and says, well, you know. Maybe they maybe they would uh, uh, enjoy helping coming around. What would you feel about it? So, I'm sorry, Stephen. Marika here. I'm sorry no, to cut good. across you. I, I, think, no, no. I think that's a yeah, it's a really good point. And one of the the things that, uh, that I've often used is that what's in the larder, and people will say, "Oh, I couldn't possibly ring my cousin." Um, you know, like she, she's busy with her own children and family and husband's unwell and blah, blah, blah. I often ask carers, well, tell me when you supported somebody, when somebody needed help and you were there. And they often say, well, you know, I used to deliver meals to Nellie and I can't quite do that. And I used to go down to the University of the Third Age and I always used to make the sandwiches because I know there were two people there that never ate. Um, and slowly they begin to see the role that they played in helping people go right. Um, and that sometimes um, allows people to become a little bit more accepting of, um, well, you know, maybe I can ask Millie to just pop in, sit with Phil, why duck down to the shop or go and get an x-ray. Maybe I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lynette, are you back on with us? No, I don't think she can no. hear us or see us. But I think that storm over Sydney has uh, yeah. wrecked a few connections, but uh, at least we've got your audio, Marika. Um, so, um, Alison, I'm uh, coming back to you. There's quite a lot of uh, uh, conversation in the chat room about carer burden and uh, the guilt or shame of not coping as a carer. Do you want to just, um, sure. you know, people really talk about it and, and perhaps that also leads to the, and the next question, which is abuse by carer or to the carer? Uh, yes, I'm happy to talk to this and it's actually, um, a, again, something um, I sort of, uh, my main thing, a main role that I do. So carer burden, um, most people will be aware the literature is, is is very firm. Um, it's really dangerous um, for them uh, medically, physically, um, psychologically. Um, th there's no doubt that it actually makes carers sick. Um, so it is, in my opinion, a high risk and, it, as I said, an unnecessary one. Um, certainly, um, in terms of doing that risk assessment, um, the, the preferable time to put in supports, by the way, for someone with dementia is is on diagnosis or if I had my way even pre-diagnosis, <laughs> during diagnosis and after, not four years later, um, you know, because they've been travelling okay. Um, that education needs to begin um, much earlier in the piece, otherwise we end up with, with many cases of, of Rosa and Phil. Um, and the carer um, emotional roller coaster is a really interesting one. And again, um, everything that the other girls said about um, validating um, and respecting that carer as a person really melts them and, and really uh, sort of gets you a long way f uh, with about 95% of them. Um, it's just understanding why they're making those decisions, educating them. Um, but once you build that rapport, that's when they start disclosing some other stuff. So they're either having you know, they try to be perfect and then when they're not. So Rosa would get cross at Phil and she snaps at him um, and then afterwards she'll feel guilty um, and then she'll beat herself up that she's not being good enough. Um, the other scenario is if you've got a carer who's really burnt out, they actually probably will be snapping at the person with dementia. They will be um, likely 
yelling at them. I had one the other week where the son um, was raising his voice at mum because mum not only was deaf, um, but very, very repetitive with very little comprehension. That no one had checked in with the son. No one had had educated him, asked him if he was okay, validated the role that he was playing in looking after his mum. Um, so I was concerned somebody may walk into that scenario and accuse that son of, of abuse, um, when indeed this son was a dedicated son who, who literally had dedicated his, his retirement to looking after mum. Um, and it was more a case of um, I felt that we as a community have let let them down in that we haven't provided um, timely support in a way that um, he could move from carer burnout into thriving so that he could go back and play his bowls and, and have his life as well as have his mum be safe and sound um, and living her best life. So to me it's all about education and support and it's to get in early. Um, and uh, it's probably a good time to mention that I'm thrilled that Dementia Australia, so this will apply um, for everyone listening, now has a brand new service um, that is a post-diagnostic support service um, and I've um, attached the information um, to the resources. Um, I certainly intend to refer pretty much everybody as soon as we give them a diagnosis. Um, so uh, let's all do the same and then we'll overwhelm the service and um, then they'll need more funding. <laughs> good, good idea, Alison, good idea. I'd like to say that PH, oh yeah, go, go ahead, Marika. Sorry again, Stephen. Um, I, thank you for that, Alison, because I think that, that's a really important messages. One of, one of the things that we all do as professionals or support people, uh, of particularly of carers, is support them to transition uh, into their next uh, bit in their life. And ultimately, when you're caring for someone, you're actually moving through a transition. You're transitioning your relationship with that person. You're transitioning your role. You're transitioning your circumstances. You know, you're having people in your home um, that you don't actually know. And you know, in Rose's uh, circumstances, um, you know, I mean, there could be cultural issues around that. Um, there's certainly issues around, I don't want anyone to come into my home. I certainly don't want anyone to come into my home and see my messy house or my, you know, come into my bathroom. I mean, that is very intimate and very, very, um, you know, invasive, no matter how, how critical that service is. So being really mindful that we are helping people through transitioning to the next stage. Um, and in, in Rose's case, and in fact in many carers' case, they're really trying to understand um, this whole thing that they're, they're doing, caring for their loved one, and they're grieving. They're constantly grieving. For those of us who are parents, I remember a nurse told me once, a baby health nurse, said, Marika, parenting is this never-ending journey of grief. And I said, oh, that sounds terrible. And she said, no, you think about it. You know, you, you grieve about being pregnant and then the baby's born and you grieve about the baby no longer breastfeeding. You grieve about the toddler becoming independent. You grieve about them moving on to school. I remember when my little one went to kindy, that was horrific for me. He had a great time. You grieve about them becoming teenagers, adults, leaving home. And I guess in many ways, when you're caring for someone, whether it's a partner or a child or a sibling, you have this grieving stage of the relationship you've had in the past. And that manifests its way in a whole range, you know, people being angry and pissed off with a care worker that comes in, uh, people being withdrawn, being resistant. So getting to know that is really important. I think that's where the role of a psychologist Mm -hmm. um, is really important, Alison. And, and there's so we... very good evidence that if we recognise anticipatory grief, uh, this will help the bereavement burden uh, greatly. So, um, absolutely. There, there are now um, psychological services that primary health networks can commission 
for emotional well-being for older people, both in the aged care facilities and since COVID into the community. So that might give us, um, with a limited workforce of gero psychologists, um, uh, might give us a little more workforce to, to be able to uh, visit people with, with this care of burden. I'm working uh, on that workforce issue, Stephen, but also uh, yeah. um, it, it is social workers as well that oh, um, absolutely. are well yeah. versed to be working um, on those emotional um, sort of factors and um, the social determinants of health. In fact, I, I'm a firm believer in all, uh, you know, the full multidisciplinary suite yeah. um, and um, from a, uh, a, a dementia specific lens, I believe that all of our disciplines um, can actually be well versed in all of our roles um, yeah. and, and particularly um, the core um, roles of OT, social work and psychology. So that worked well tonight. Um, supporting the GP and that's the model that I would love to see out in the community um, to actually keep people out of hospital um, and to, to you know keep people at home as long as um, is possible so um, I am I want to put a sort of a pointy little um, question forth to everyone though uh, what do we do with the the urgent risks um, because we're focused on Rosa, but what about the fact that Phil is wandering? Um, mm. And we don't know, for example, if she's still trusting him to take his own medications. He's got high blood pressure, so he's likely on a um, hypertensive medication. Um, is he mucking that up, or is she um, at least um, in charge of that? So. Um, Again, well, Lynette, what do you think? Because you're, you've not had enough enough uh, options because your your audio I'm went. Sorry, so. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. I had a clap of lightning and I disappeared. Yes. Um, yep. I mean, really, it, it, the situation needs to be looked at as it evolves and unravels when you when you do actually um, see the person. I mean, I don't. I think it would be really hard hard to identify what the issues might be with Phil without doing the home visit that's goals and actually spending some time with him in his own environment, you know, where he would be most comfortable. I think it would be very hard to work out what you could do in a consulting room, for instance, when, you know, Phil and Rosa come to see a GP. I think it would be very difficult to make an evaluation of his behaviour or his status. I mean, I'm very concerned that Rosa might not be able to leave the house or leave him and what some of the issues might be and whether or not she has to go everywhere with him to sort of, I don't know, walk the dog. I don't know what else has to happen without having a chat and finding out what the um, routines are for them as a couple. But, you know, even um, it sounds as though Francesca might not be around so much to do shopping and things like that. I don't but know everyone if they relies have... on a... Yeah. 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 I don't know everyone... if they have a computer. Yeah. I would expect yeah. they probably do. If yeah. um, Phil has had an academic life, I would expect yeah. them both to be familiar with a computer, in which case there are ways you could get around the having to go to the shops thing. But I would imagine that there would be an issue for Rosa just needing to be around him all the time and not being able to have a shower, for instance, herself, and all of that sort of thing. So I'm um, wondering if you, as the eight cat specialist, um, <laughs> Uh, assuming that they're given the, the golden grail of uh, a, a level four package, we're, we're making many yeah. assumptions here. Uh, how far in your experience does that go in getting enough support to to support her and keep him at home? And, and is it possible to keep him at home without bringing in community support? 
in, in the terms that Marika was talking about, and it takes a village, Alison's um, well, it does. It does. phrase. Yes. yes. I mean, what does a yes. level four package realistically offer? There may be people, participants who don't really know about what some of these level packages uh, give, but they certainly would give respite uh, for, Absolutely. for Rosa. Yes. Absolutely. But a lot depends on, again, as somebody else was saying, how um, averse they are to having lots of people they don't know in their home. Mm -hmm. You see that will be a major hurdle as well mm -hmm. as even if they got to the point where Rosa would accept some help, it might be baby steps first so that that trust can build up. You can have success with a small improvement and then build on that to a slightly larger amount of help. I think going from zero to level four might be a, a little bit of a um, difficult thing for Rosa to um, cope well, with or adjust to. Lynette, but, luckily yeah. for us, the system has an 18-month wait on level four packages. Yes. So I know. I was then going to say. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> I was then going to say all the trust things then become difficult. You know, you could get them to agree to this, and then say, well, well actually, you won't hear from anyone for ages. <laughs> yeah. So this is the wicked problem, isn't it? Because the Royal Commission yes. has assessed that more people are going to want to spend more time at home. And yet we've got yep. this 18 month lag on the on the yep. packages. So, you know, a word to to everyone out there, just get everyone registered for that package. Call, call Lynette and her team, get the ACAT assessment done and then see, you know, there's plenty of time in that 18 months that if it's not in there, um, like the insurance policy, unfortunately, it'll be residential care. Mm. Mm. So. And I think um, knowing dementia um, well, Phil actually already has a moderate stage dementia. Um, and I don't think, as much as I respect um, that it takes time to sort of build rapport with Rosa, I think there is some urgency here in yes. terms of yes. getting a combination of um, formal and informal support, uh, pretty much I tend yes. to use whatever's available. Um, if, if he had a, a mild dementia, you know, and his cognitive screening scores were like 26 out of 30, but keep in mind this is a, a very bright man, so he's had further to fall, and the fact that he's now scoring 16 out of 30 means that he's actually really um, quite a long way along. She's already neglecting herself. Um, and may yes. end up, you know, with her own, probably no one's educated her that feels at higher risk of delirium. Um, any number of things can go wrong. So, yeah, I, I sort of, um, any um, sort of reluctance on Rose's part, I tend to um, combat, if you like, with um, the, the risk of, of not being able to keep him at home. I'll show my, my English heritage comes from the Latin cure, cura. And I think we often think that uh, good care will, will cure the situation, but unfortunately, sometimes um, what we hope for doesn't happen. And uh, a family sometimes expect that from residential care. Um, probably got lower expectations of care at home, but can still have very high expectations. How do we deal with some of those higher expectations of family members who think that the formal carers um, can, can uh, do, do miracles? Do you encounter that, any, anyone on the, on the panel? Working with the families? Yes. Everyone's yeah, good. We've you're got nodding, Lynette. Audio. I am not sure if your audience. I'm that. I'm trying oh, to think of oh, some no. specific examples, but yes. One of the I classic from problems. Lots yes. of people with very unrealistic expectations. Yes. 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 And I I think that's part of our task, is to say that you know there isn't a cure for this. I mean we so expect uh, modern medicine to 
be able to cure everything. And yet, um, of course, aging, grief, loss are not curable. So I'm, I'm not telling anyone in this in this wise well, audience anything they don't know. It's just David, we are often faced with that challenge. Interestingly, the research showed that um, a large proportion of the population don't realise that dementia um, will kill you. Mm. Um, so it was actually leans the other way that they're they're not uh, they don't realise. Um, you know, so that's a, that was really interesting mm. to me, and and again mm. reinforces that need to educate. I was just mm. wondering, uh, there was a question. Um, the um, I think um, from one of the GPs about um, when when their patient or the family of the uh, their patient doesn't disclose any of these problems, um, mm -hmm. what's what are they um, meant to do? Um, and I just was quickly going to say that um, even though every individual is different, again having a, a, a solid knowledge base of of dementias um, and just using simple screening tools um, can be a really good um, indicator in terms of um, what risks match up with what degree of cognitive impairment, if mm -hmm. you like. So mm -hmm. um, those scores, when they're getting quite bad, typically mean that they won't be taking their medications correctly, that they might be at risk of um, mm -hmm. when they're driving um, and those sort of things. Um, but again, I think sometimes um, GPs um, in the consult room with limited time, I think it must be really tough. Um, it, it's not like you can press people. Um, and if, yeah. if, like most scenarios, the person with dementia continues to visit on their own, mm -hmm. um, and and one of the main symptoms of dementia for most of the main dementias is lack of insight, um, yeah. then there is no information forthcoming. Um, and I think that that's a really tricky one. So I think these new services where they're dementia specific services that we as a community can introduce on diagnosis is a probably a beautiful and compassionate way of getting around um, some of those symptoms as they emerge um, because I, to me that's um, the biggest wicked problem um, probably for mm. GPs is, mm. is you can't sit there and talk to a person about their symptoms when their main symptom is loss of insight. Loss of insight, um, yes. Because it's actually quite cruel. We don't grab them by the shoulders and go, mm. remember, you've got mm. dementia. <laughs> and therefore yeah. that means. Um, so yeah, I'm quite hopeful that um, new sort of um, methods that we've been speaking about um, that are stemming from the Royal Commission discussion, multidisciplinary teams, community-based teams um, with the GP as the lead um, could quite beautifully address um, uh, many of these um, issues um, in the future. I'm, I'm quite optimistic about it. Can I, I'm going to interrupt there and I'm just going to, to challenge us all a little bit. It's Marika here again. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the purpose of this, this session was really to focus on the carer and the mental health of the carer. And what we often do is always pivot our attention on the person that is being cared for. I know you're shaking your head and not suggesting that we've done that. And it's like, it's a little bit like a chicken or egg is like, we can't really address the mental health of the carer without addressing the care needs, the diagnosis, the intervention of the person that needs caring. But often a carer um, is saying, look, you know, he's, he's had everything um, and I've, I've hid behind that. What about me? Um, am I someone, even if I'm not caring for Phil? Um, and and often it's it's you know carers themselves like to say, look, don't worry about me. I'm absolutely fine. As indeed Rosa has. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not so you know Phil, Phil, Phil. But I think we need to get in and understand. And of course, a GP does not have the time. And in this instance. 
um, the GP was fantastic in sort of saying, hey, I didn't even realise I was your GP. Um, let's go get an X-ray. It doesn't have that time. So again, I'm going to go back to this compassionate community that is around Rosa. How do we use them to lift her up to really say, Rosa, you are just as important and without you and your well-being, let's just focus on you for a second. Let's just focus yeah. on you. And I think, you know, Stephen, you asked a question earlier is how do we involve and engage Francesca and her, her now, you know, year 12 daughter um, and Nelly the neighbour and other people. How do we engage them in a non-intrusive way? Not to, obviously, education is really important. That's the insight stuff that we've just been talking about, really important. Phil may have lost some insight, but how do we um, engage and support Rosa to educate the people around her? Look, Phil's at, got being diagnosed with dementia. He's still Phil and I'm still Rosa, um, but this is what he's likely to behave like. Um, you know. And I think we need to turn our attention to Rosa as an individual, just for a little bit um, in, in really looking at caring for her. And some of those questions I put up earlier is, you know, what gives you joy, Rosa? Um, who do you trust? Um, who do you miss? You know, it might be like, you know, I really miss Helen down at the, um, at the bolo when I used to play bowls every Tuesday. I haven't seen her in over 12 months. We don't know. Well, how about we call Helen? How about you call Helen? There's a goal for you. Let's call Helen. So again, I mean, this session is really looking at us understanding the mental health challenges of carers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, of course, it's difficult to separate that from the person that they're cared for. But we need to, to be able to focus our attention on Rosa, um, uh, obviously interdependently with Phil but really focusing on her and what's important for her. You've pro to me, you've probably okay. just highlighted, Marika, the, um, the reason why um, a dementia-specific uh, workforce is essential because there, it is impossible um, to do one without the other. Um, mm. And if a carer is getting to the point where they're saying, what about me? I consider that we're doing it wrong. Um, so, yes. because my entire focus, I, I have many families saying to me, oh, I thought you'd be working with dad. And I'm like, no, the, the entirety, <laughs> even though I uh, assist with diagnosing dementia, uh, almost the entirety of the work that I do is with the carer and is about the carer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. um, certainly that shouldn't be mistaken, um, but at the same time, I can't help Rosa get back to gardening and, and bridge um, if um, the reality is that Phil can't be left home alone um, yes. because he's going to yeah. burn the house down or he's going to wander onto the highway. Um, so I find um, that description, um, what you said, it's exactly true. Um, and that therein lies the skill is that when you come on board with a case that's at this stage with no support, it's a juggling act. I actually find that I have to do several things within that first session, um, pretty much a, a little bit of everything, a little bit of validation, a little bit of risk assessment, a little bit of checking in with her, you know, and, and cramming it all in because there's no one thing less important than the other. Um, to me, that's always been um, the hardest skill of all. Um, and I even yep. find that I, I do a little nod to grief and loss. And for, for some who are ready, I, I flag that and say, hmm. that is there. We, we, you know, there's no time to get to it at the moment, but just flagging with them that hmm. that is also that anticipatory grief. So, yeah, it's just naming it. Just naming it. Done. Just hmm. naming it. Well, we need to clone you about uh, 10,000 times, don't we, to. Uh, to deal with the, the challenge of the, the numbers of people who are going to need those kinds of services. So that's great. Can, can I just ask you, Lynn? And the TV panel shows, they ask for a two minute summary of, uh, of how you feel, you know, things have gone in terms of looking at 
Rose's situation. Well, I think Marika, Marika and Alison have covered all the all the caring and um, social and psychological components really clearly. Mm. I guess what I'm concerned about as an OT would be to um, make sure that um, Rosa is able to um, mobilise and transfer and undertake her own self-care as well as feel self-care safely with a gammy knee um, and osteoarthritis that she might have in other joints, not just the knee. It's only because she fell that the knee turned into a problem. And um, there would be a whole range of things we could look at to try and prevent her falling and Phil falling as well, for that yeah. matter. In so the important, home. So, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, so important because that's what does send you to hospital and then, and then yeah. into... Uh, Quick uh, fractured a, femur and off you go, yes, and the risk of then long the bubble of care the, after of the that. That's right. Are so huge. let's try and let's try and keep all the roses and fields at home, and uh, I think we've got to the stage which uh, um, I, I want to thank you three for uh, what you've contributed. It's always too short, but um, uh, I think. You've summed up beautifully many of many of the issues that we face and many of the solutions that are out there. So, um, the, the, one of the themes that came out of the last uh, webinar was uh, hope. So, I think um, we we, we uh, share that hope uh, with with Rosa and Phil and and all those like them. That will be helpful. So and thank you to uh, our engaged audience and for all of your entries into the chat box. Of course, we haven't answered all of your questions, but um, uh, maybe there'll be more more opportunities down the track. Um, and perhaps the, the take home message is one of hope and respect and the wish that the needs of the kind carers of our nation will continue to be met by all in the community, including animals. For you pet lovers, they play a very important part, as do televisions, and they're informal carers too. And by all the professionals working together uh, collaboratively and assertively across all of our disciplines. So um, I'll just move the... Uh, There is a res supporting resources tab on your screen and you'll be sent a recording of tonight's webinar um, as an email. Uh, and there are also, I should say, many excellent past webinars available on the MHPN website. Local networking. I've had a, a great personal experience of this apart from these webinars with the support of the MHPN team and our PHN in, uh, in Sydney North. We've been running meetings now for a couple of years, so the same sort of audience as is here tonight. Uh, I think we've, most we've ever got is about 100 people squashed into a room, obviously more for the, uh, for the uh, webinars. Um, Addressing issues which have ranged from First Nation elder well-being to BPSD to addictions, mood, medication. We've had talks from art and music therapists, and we've even been able to screen a couple of outstanding documentaries. So I, I really do encourage you to contact MHPN either in the in the um, feedback at the end or, or just by calling them. Start one in your area. Um, these are the kinds of discussions that you can have in every area. There are wonderful um, social workers, occupational therapists, and geropsychologists, counsellors, community members. So uh, MHPN is incredibly supportive in setting up one of these uh, networks. So I really do encourage you to do that. 
And by way of this great partnership between the 31 PHNs and MHPN, uh, the final webinar in this series next year, as I said, we'll explore aging from a First Nations and multicultural perspective. So uh, don't forget to fill in the exit survey. That's the most important thing, most important job for me tonight. And so uh, thank you for putting up with the thunderstorm, but I do think it was a good metaphor the unexpected and so good night to all and don't forget to care for yourselves you can't care for others unless we all care for ourselves thank you for your participation and I look forward to seeing you in the new year keep your eye out for the announcement of the next webinar thank you